So obviously, um, I'm the, uh, the the general manager of uh, Samstruck. We're uh, we're part of a, a larger group called uh, Syngen Group. Um, we're a uh, head contractor in our own right, a commercial builder and a residential builder. Um, and then we have a sort of a breakaway company called Stanstruct and we specialise in the assembly of um, mass timber structures. So um, I suppose we sort of, we saw an opening in the market probably oh, four, four or so years ago now. Uh, we got involved with probably one of the, you know, one, one of the first, I want to say the first, but one of, one of, the, one of the first uh, sort of commercial timber buildings uh, in Victoria, which is the vertical extension of the uh, Caulfield Monash University Business School uh, with Kane Constructions. So we, uh, we sort of jumped on board with that uh, and we've sort of grown uh, ever since um, and been part of uh, some of probably Australia's uh, biggest timber projects. Um, so notably, I suppose, the, the Ballarat Gulf Hub uh, with Kane. Uh, we worked alongside those guys there on a JV with Kane and Nicholson Construction. Um, we went down to Tasmania uh, with XLAM to uh, build, I think, 19, 19 buildings down, down there, which is probably around about four, three and a half thousand cubic metres of CLT down in Tasmania. So we, down, we were down there for eight months uh, doing, doing those buildings down there, which is, you know, if you, have, if you haven't sort of had a look at that job, I would, I'd suggest, you know, having a look at it. It's a pretty amazing, uh, amazing, amazing project. Um, and probably notably, uh, the most recent project we're, we're, we're part of is the Bendigo Gov Hub, which we're um, currently sort of uh, tracking through level two as we speak. Yeah, and it was a good call for you or when you jumped into Mass Timber and there's a lot of exciting projects on the table now. When we spoke a week and a half ago in preparation for this, it was you know one thing that uh, really popped up and that was just about when um, installers should be engaged for projects. So we might just... That'll be might be our starting point and see where it goes. So, I mean, what yeah, sure. what are the benefits of having a, an installer on early, and what sort of uh, issues can be ironed out early in the process? Yeah, absolutely, Adam. Um, we we always sort of push to to get 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 on early. Um, you know, it's probably against our better judgment sometimes giving away some of our IP. Uh, but you know, in the interests of the project um, and bringing that consulted team together, um, getting the installer on early, you're gonna you're gonna iron out all those those design little design problems and 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 nuances around the install uh, early on. I mean, there's you know we we all know once we get to site and you know we've got cranes swinging and you know we're paying for personnel. Those small little issues can cause you know catastrophic program um, problems on site. So getting a, getting an installer on early uh, really and really you know really being collaborative. Uh, <clears throat> you know the builder and the consultants being collaborative with the install installer and taking on board their their points and lessons learned from previous projects is 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 is, is unbelievably beneficial to the project um holistically <clears throat> you know we sort of we move through move through connection detailing to crane locations to you know to access points to sequencing and you know all these all these early discussions um that you know that probably sometimes get left to a manufacturer to decide, to decide, or an engineer to decide, or you know, a builder to decide. And most of the time, it's you know one of their first projects, and you know, and and, and that really, it, you can really tell the difference between having an installer who's been on early on a project and assisted the whole way through um, to you know a, a project that sort of you know the horses bolted a little bit, and you know we're, we're sort of come on and get stuck with 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 decisions that have been made by other people. So it's extremely important, I think, to have a uh, have an installer on board early, even in that design and development stage as well. Yeah, and so working closely with the designers up front is really important. Um, yeah. You un unlocked a whole bunch. I mean, like connections could be one where engineers yeah. just look at it, the amount of fixings and screws. But I mean, you're hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, and we've seen yeah we've seen a bit of a shift now. Like we've always sort of said, like you know, for a long time. These, you know, the connections are best off doing being being uh, being installed in a in controlled environment. So in a factory, the more you can do in a factory in a controlled environment, you've got no inclement weather, you've got the ability to run double shifts, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the more you can do off site, the better off you're going to be on site. And we're sort of starting to see that whole sort of shift now 
with the manufacturers trying to you know facilitate as much as they can in a um, in a factory setting before we get to site and and we really are seeing the difference on site for program like it's it's a, it's a huge difference on site with program um, so you know I think I think it's a it's a good thing for industry the way we're sort of shifting at the moment and really emphasizing that off site um, you know model yeah and, and related one like connections and prefixing as many connections as possible to expedite the program yep. Yep. Um, related ones always is going to be like tolerances and designing for tolerances I mean what what sort of yep. issues is this a common issue that comes up and perhaps doesn't get paid enough attention to do you think oh 100 percent and I mean uh, the thing is we're not we're sort of we're we're, we're so similar to a structural t- steel assembly but we're so far away um, when we when we talk about tolerances and a lot of our you know a lot of our connections are are concealed within that char of the of the timber so you know accessing pockets and trying to execute bolts and things like that you know th- you really need that precision there so you know we we always sort of look for a seating or a locating mechanism within our within our connections and you know ask the designers to and the consultants to sort of design that in that pulls into the pulls that pulls that tolerance into alignment um, and you know all your usual suspects when you when you're interfacing with other structure precast um, concrete uh, structural steel that's where we like to build that little bit of redundancy and we we know we're confident that you know we're we're the design the design around the timber to timber connections are, are are quite you know quite tolerable um, it's the uh, it's the interface with other structure that we get a bit that we get a bit sort of nervous about and it's 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 always the way so we we always build that tolerance into those those areas um, and program wise you you always slow down when you're interfacing with those structures so yeah and yeah. and you find uh, just on that like the first the first level i guess that's where you're always going to be with your other materials yeah 100 um, percent. Yep. is that always going to be the, the yeah 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 to get going? exactly right i mean most 100 percent of the time you, you're building off a off a slab on ground or a podium so you you know you're connecting the concrete on the first level for your columns so and that's and that's setting the setting the, the the tone for the rest of the project. So we always spend a little bit more time on that level, making making sure you know you, you all your embedments are in and levels and RLs are correct, and you know setting the pace for the rest of the building. So you know that's that's just a, a sort of a rule of thumb that is reflected in the program. That you know off podium is a little bit slower. Timber to timber is always nice and quick, depending on connections, obviously. Uh, and then interfacing with with other structure, you sort of slow up a little bit. But again, I think you know when you know we we, we get builders sort of look at look at the program and sort of say, okay, we've got you know members that have got to go in, and you know how many members can you get in a day? And that's sort of the basis of their critical path build up. But we sort of you know we need to sort of pull back and say there's so other, there's so many other variables that go into that critical path activity. You know, like you've got to it's, it's all a sequential sort of uh sort of path we need to go down we 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 do the columns the beams we put the clt on we execute the fi- the fixings in that the permanent fixings in that clt concurrently uh then we can then when we're tied off to the core we can then start columns and beams and you get a little bit of concurrency through the columns and beams glue lamb sections but certainly clt uh you know there's a there's a heavy requirement for permanent fixings to be in before you start bracing the the next level of uh, glue and columns and beams so we always sort of built like make a lot of em- bring a lot of emphasis into it's not just about putting members in it's about all that concurrent sundry work that needs to be completed as part of the overall structure and, and making sure we're we're really really uh you know focusing on those hold points so that you know nothing's nothing's missed along the way yeah one of those things uh so concrete you know, it might not fit, everything might not fit perfectly up front and concrete might be out by a greater tolerance and timber. Do you see an importance in, or have anything comment on, on in terms of surveying as you go up the building? So uh, something I don't know too much about, but yeah. I can imagine you can iron out issues earlier in the installation rather than uh, later maybe. Yeah, 100%. And we put that down to our, we, 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 that falls under our enabling work banner, so to speak. Uh, so all those sort of interfaces, we we prefer a surveyor to come in and uh, site weld those connections um, rather than try and try and design a, a cumbersome connection to take up a, a, an amount of tolerance. So you know, and that and that again falls in that concurrency sort of area within the you know you can be installing in an area, 
while that concurrent work of the survey and, and site welding of those structural or fabricated steel connections can be occurring. So that's how we deal with those sort of tolerances around those areas. Um, and, you know, all, there's, there's many, obviously many ways you can do it, but, um, you know, and, and seeing wherever you can, if it's passively fire protected, if it's under a, uh, if it's, if it's a, not exposed, the area you're working with, you know, developing a fabricated steel, uh, fabricated uh, connection that's a, a seated connection, something you can seat, you can put a bolt in, you can take it off the hook, you can keep moving. So th those sort of things like, you know, sort of designing for designing for the, uh, the, the, the assembly, I suppose, and, and, can, and taking into consideration that, you know, there's, there's valuable time and money in cranage and personnel. Yeah, well, that's probably one that always gets me astray, like the minimising the, the hook time. Mm. I mean, if, and assuming that is the critical path, right? So it's the yep. cost of designing connection might cost a bit more in terms of material, but if you're making your job quicker, it'd make a big difference, yeah? 100%, that's exactly right. And, you know, it's, and, it's, and it's beneficial for the whole project as well. The, the sooner you can move up through that building, the sooner you're allowed, you can start putting facade on, you can start, you know, loading with mechanical and hydraulic and all the, all the other stuff. So, you know, it's, it's beneficial for the job holistically. You might spend a little bit more money up front, but, you know, for, for program and, 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 and job, um, overall job health, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Yeah, you've, you've, we've been speaking a lot about program. Maybe we've completely squeezed out of the juice out of that one, but is there anything else that's uh, in terms of improving that in the critical path? Because as you know, when we're trying to compete with concrete buildings, we're competing on being faster. A lot of the times we're trying to be cost comparative or, or beating them in terms of cost. So it's absolutely critical yeah. that we um, knock the yeah. building out as quick as we can. So is there anything else on that? Yeah, I think I think just paying special attention to your to your logistics as well. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of nuance nuance in in uh, the way you develop your panel sizing, for instance, and um, how much material you put on a truck, and you know that that's all that all feeds into the critical path as well. Like we need to we need to be afforded time to unload unload trucks, and you know that's a portion of the day, whether it's a two deliveries per day or one delivery per day. That that takes a portion of time and cranage out of the picture on critical path. So. You know, making special considerations for panel sizing when you're talking in-gauge and out-of-gauge trucks and curfews on Victorian roads and things like that and alternative routes. And uh, we sort of develop a live sort of tracking program where we can we can feed in information on a daily basis. And that's shared in a communication matrix with the builder, the consultants, the manufacturers and us. And we feed that information in each day. And that sort of, that, that gives the manufacturers an idea of how we're tracking on site and how those deliveries are looking. And if we sort of, we get an inclement weather day, we sort of plug that in and, you know, that gets fed, fed into the whole communication matrix and we can sort of allocate that logistics accordingly. So that's a huge part of facilitating the success on site is really honing on the logistics and, and, and how you manage that. Um, you know, if you've got three or four trucks sitting out in the street ready to be unloaded and, you know, you, there's been no communication with the, the manufacturer um, you know, there's a there's a day gone unloading and trying to find a lay down area to put material in, and it, it can get very messy very quickly. Yeah. Well, in your experience, how many? Like we were saying before uh, we started recording, that it's a bit of a story. Just in time manufacturing sounds good. Um, yeah. With our logistics, is it how often? I mean, straight off the truck, the sequence is right. Is double handling something that? You've sort I mean, of bake in yeah, or something can I be think, designed I think, out for. I think we I think we always have a little bit of contingency for double handling. Um, you know, not everything can be nested perfectly uh, on a on a on a truck for for safety reasons. So there's always a there's always a little bit of you know a back and forth about how we you know double handle and move things around. But for the most part, we would we would expect that you know us being on early as a contractor would iron out most of those sequencing issues. And if there if there was you know, precarious looking loads or things like that, we would we would sequence that in a way that we could sort of deal with that on site and, and to suit the site conditions. So there always is an element of double handling, but you know, it's um it needs to just be needs to be considered and 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 planned for us, I think. Mm, fantastic. And when we're installing on site, uh, is there any ways or any things we need to be mindful of? Uh, I guess, avoiding the risk of damaging the product um, yep. on site. And there's obviously a few ways that that might, might happen, but what's, what's yep. say the 80, 20 of things are everyone should be thinking about. 
so we're sort of we've sort of moved away from the whole we have to protect every visual um, visual element in the building. We we we're we're sort of you know promoting the the fact that it is a, a it is still a structural uh, material, uh, and there has to be a, an allowance for a level of finishing. Um, you know, if you're pouring an in situ concrete column, there's a level of level of finishing that occurs on that prior to the, a handover, and and it should be the same sentiment for structural timber. Um, we sort of when we're dealing with when we're when we're dealing with UV exposure and all that sort of stuff. If we're wrapping these wrapping these columns and wrapping these beams, you know the the management and keeping that wrapping maintained throughout a throughout a large project is actually detrimental to the the whole protection exercise. We get a little bit of you know a little bit of little bit of UV um, UV staining on an unprotected area or a, or, a, or, a, or a piece of material that's had uh, the the uh, you know the the membrane peel off during during high winds. That's going to be more detrimental to the actual, you know, the visual intent of the of the um, the uh, timber. So we sort of let everything sort of we sort of let everything UV at the same rate, um, you know, expose at the same rate. We're pretty comfortable with those floor cycles, so we 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 we're covering areas up. The the emphasis is moving through that building, getting a lid on it, and closing it up. It's not you know sort of you know trying to protect a jewelry box. Um, we do ask though that you know there is a consideration by the manufacturer to put a UV sort of water repellent uh, primary coat on those on those elements before they're on, on site just to protect them during install, um, mm-hmm. and it also protects from you know your your rigor with a with a dirty hand or or whatever, and it stops that sort of that that dust and grime impregnating the timber. We do we do protect the columns with a rigid protection up to 2400 high. Just to stop those follow-on trades and AWP reticulation and all those things. So, um, in terms of protection, that's the that's the extent of what we sort of do on site. We're more focused on the critical path activity of assembling the structure. Um, with the CLT and exposed to feet, we get we we move away from slings. Uh, a pre-slung arrangement. We go to a custom lifting bracket arrangement, which means we're lifting from the the top of the CLT. We're not plugging. Uh, any you know hole, sling holes in the in the in the CLT to feet. Uh, we don't have to passively fire protect those holes either. Um, so and it's and it's a much more it's a much more sort of uh, visually pleasing um, you know result from not having sort of gr- trying to grain match plugs and and you know putting putting you know other bits of material into laminas and things like that. So um, that's the way we sort of deal with the CLT from a visual perspective, and we. We think it's a lot. Uh, it's a lot better for program as well because we don't have to revisit that, that predecessing floor to to do you know secondary work. Yeah, now that's that's a good one. I like that. Um, yep. So it's been great speaking to you today, Woody. Yep. Uh, there's been so much involved. Looking <laughs> looking forward, what do you see as the future of timber construction? What sort of gets you excited in this space of installation? Um, there's obviously a few exciting projects on the table and, and the plate few at the moment. Yeah, absolutely, mate. And you know, I think I think it's just uh, bigger and better. Um, you know, when we sort of we sort of came on four years ago, there was a little bit floating around, and you know, we were we were we were dabbling in a little bit of domestic and a little bit of commercial, and you know, everyone sort of everyone was sort of you know a bit cagey about you know is this timber timber thing going to work, and how does that work from an acoustic perspective? <coughs> Pardon me. How does that work from a a, a fire mitigation perspective? And, I think now that you know we're seeing some of these government jobs come online, and you know the Victorian government, the federal government are sort of committing to you know these timber buildings. We're really seeing a little bit more, you know, a lot of people becoming more comfortable with designing in in timber. And um, you know, some of the projects that are coming across our desk are you know are, are really really exciting projects. You know, and they're you know they're pushing the limits of design, they're pushing the limits of manufacturing, pushing the limits of install, and it. And it's keeping, I think it's keeping everyone on their toes. And I think we're going to see some pretty amazing um, sort of projects start to start to come to fruition in the next sort of couple of years, I think. Yeah, there is, sure is. And then Australia will be leading the way again. There's what? 100%. Uh, three or four high rise, maybe, right? Looking at 23, yep. all with, uh, yeah, good fire protection, good fire engineering strategies. Absolutely. Right out of exposed timber. And uh, yeah, it'll yep. unlock 
insane amounts yeah. of volume. Yeah, for, and I think and I think the, the good thing is there's been a lot of investment by you know by people that are that are building in timber with the the testing and the and the fire testing they've done and that that huge amount of investment and that that you know that that uh, trading history there is, is is hugely beneficial for industry at the moment and you know and it's really it's really gaining some confidence. Yeah. Well, it's exciting times, Woody. Uh, thanks yep. so much for coming on the podcast. If people want to find out more about yourself or Sinjin or uh, is anywhere anyone should go that you want to point them to? Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you um, want to visit our website, it's www.stanstruck.com.au. Um, uh, all our details are, uh, are there to contact uh, either myself or, or the guys at Sinjin for any head contract work you, you may want to uh, engage us in. So, yeah.